Open our eyes, oh God, that we may see you even clearer, oh God. We praise you, holy King. Hallelujah. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you. How you lift it up. Shining in the light of your glory. just sharing that we have more to look forward to than we have behind us. We talk about seeing the Lord, just to think about it, that what a grand and glorious uh, event awaits us. In fact, to be in his presence forever is something that is more joyous than we could possibly ever imagine. So praise God for that song. We praise God for this opportunity to come before you tonight, and we trust that the Word of God will uh, pierce and penetrate your heart and be the difference in your lives. We want to also announce that on this coming Saturday, we, our classes are still carried on, our foundation classes beginning at 11 o'clock a.m. and we go to 12.15 p.m. and we encourage you to be a part of those classes because we talk about foundations. We all need it. In fact, I get so much out of the classes myself when I'm listening to the instructions given by members of the church as we talk about those things that could help to strengthen our foundation. And in this day, with all of the challenges that we're facing in life, we're going to be challenged at the very root and core of our uh, faith and our, our walk. And in this, we have to make sure that our, uh, make sure our foundations are sure. 
So I encourage all of you, uh, not only for you, but others that you may know, even if you're not a member of Cross Culture Church, these teachings, I can guarantee you, will make a difference in your lives. Now we're going to get into the Word tonight as we prepare hearts and minds. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity, for, what, for the things that you're sharing with us, for the difference you're making in our lives. And my prayer is that as we impart the Word, that that Word uh, will find entrance into each heart and each life. We give you the honor and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing on this series that look like it's endless because there's so much to say about the goodness of God. And we're calling the series The Origin of Goodness, but now we're looking into different aspects of the goodness of God. And this is part 14 of the teachings. And uh, one of the things look like when I minister on, on one occasion, it triggers thought that need to be further developed. The insights given in one message triggers more insights yet to be expounded upon. So tonight we're going to continue particularly on that passage of scripture that I shared on Sunday morning here in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Let's go back to that because we're going to talk about reasoning again, and I'm using as a subtitle tonight, for a good reason, for a good reason, uh, and the invitation that was given by God here in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. He says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And look at how God puts it. He first of all invites us to reason with him. He says, come now, which means that the posture, position, that you're currently taken is not the position that you're invited to enter into. It says, in other words, rise up from where you are and come to where I am so that we might reason together. And this is the Lord speaking, and he speaks of the current conditions of the soul, the current conditions of our lives. For he says, though your sins or like scarlet. He does not, when he calls us to reason, he does not uh, come to a place of excusing sin or ignoring sin. But he says, though your sins, which indicates or suggests the fact that those sins are there, and he describes the sin. He says, though they are like scarlet. In other words, they are red like scarlet. He says that your sins are very apparent. Your sins are very uh, damaging. They're red like scarlet. He says, they shall be. He then begins to project into the future, and he begins to let us know, I would, begin, I would say, the result of reasoning together, the, the outcome of reasoning together. They shall be. They shall be as white as snow. He will transform that which was as red as scarlet into becoming white as snow. Then he says, though they, and he used the word red again, he said, though they are like scarlet, then he says, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. They shall be as uh, sheep's wool. Now, when we talk about the transformation that takes place as a result of reasoning together with God, when we reason together with him, uh, we come to the place of understanding that there is a connection that occurs 
as a result of reasoning with him. Now, when we talk about reasoning, I had to look at what are we speaking of when we speak of reasoning. It is a cause and a reason when we talk about what God is doing. When he talks about reason, he is talking about principles or motives. Principles or motives. When we talk about reasoning, a cause, there's a cause and a reason. And then we look at principles and motives. I'm going to talk about that for a moment so we can kind of unpack this. We talk about the reasoning. Reasoning has to do with the mind. Uh, the mind. We're looking at a cause. What are we focusing our attention upon? The mind, the will, and the emotions are engaged in reasoning. If we are to reason, our minds, our wills, and emotions are engaged. But there must be, we talked about principles and mot or motives, there must be a motive or a motivation that would bring us to the place of reasoning. And in this, when the Lord invites us to reason together, we must be motivated by the love of God, the love for God, motivated for, by the love that we have for God. Now we talk about loving God. The Bible says, love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might, or with all of your strength. When it talks about loving God to that extent, you understand the reason that it is required of us to love him with our, all of our hearts and souls and minds is because of the fact that he has loved us with his all, all that God has, all that he is. Because the Bible says God is love, and God expresses that love by giving himself to us. So it's really saying that since God has given his all to us, our response to his love or that principle or that motive that is there is to love him back. We must be motivated by his love so that we are empowered to love him back. Now understand, there we go back to goodness because when we talk about God's love, God loving us, and his motivation is because of his goodness, because God is good. In other words, we can see the fact that God is good because God is love. Since God loves us with all that he has, then that is in and of itself an expression of his goodness. So our, motiva our motivation now, what motivates us to love God with all that we have, with all of our heart, soul, and mind? The only way that we can love God with all of our hearts, and our, all of our souls, and with all of our minds, it has to be as a response to the revelation of his love. Now listen to me carefully. What am I saying here? To say that we, how are we to respond to him? What would motivate us to love him back? We cannot love him back lest his love is revealed to us whereby we can actually see as a result of what he has made us to see or to understand the depths of his love. So in other words, love, even though we have received it, we are yet discovering aspects of the love of God. That's why he talks about to know the height, the depth, the width, the breadth of his love. And when it talks about the dimensions of his love, we come to understand that it surpasses knowledge, but yet throughout our lives, we are discovering aspects of his love. So when we discover an aspect of his love, that becomes a motivation, it becomes a motive uh, for loving him. And we are motivated by that to respond and actually to distribute the love 
that we have received from him. So now the things that motivate your actions is, are the things that you love the most. Whatever motivates action on your part, what is, what is the thing? Why do you get up in the morning? What is the thing that stirs you? At the beginning of your day, what is the thing that will keep you moving forward throughout the day? Well, the truth of the matter is that's the thing that you love the most. And when you really think about it, when it says love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, it becomes the God or goddess that you love. So in other words, instead of loving God, whatever motivates you replaces God. That's the thing that replaces God and becomes a God unto you. And understand, this is an idol, and you've placed that God before the true and living God. So now when we look at all of this, we look at the motive of our actions, the thing that brings us to action, it is really the measure, how we measure our love towards God based upon how we are motivated. We measure based upon our motivation. We say, well, I'm, I have low motivation. I'm not, I'm not inspired. I'm not at a place where I feel the energy to participate in the activities that God would have me to participate in. In fact, that's a measure. That's the measure. Sometimes when we talk about loving God with all, it may appear to be extreme. It may appear to be extreme, but true faith in God is extremely radical. You talk about really loving God. We talk about the measure. To really love God with all, he didn't say love me with some of your heart, with some of your soul, and with some of your mind. Give me a, a courtesy, uh, a glance or appreciation. But he says, no, love me with all of your heart and all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. You see, that's radical. That's saying that there's nothing left outside of that. So in other words, everything that you engaged in, it, it is done a, as a part of that engagement, the attachment that you have in loving God with all. Now, if you go to the New Testament, we'll begin to see that Paul spoke of that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, when he says, let this mind or allow this mind to be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. So when he says, allow this mind, he is saying, love God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your might. And he says, and he says, this is how you do it. You allow, he's talking about the believer now, once you've surrendered your heart to the Lord, true surrender, died to self, given yourself over to him, then when we talk about the soul, which is still in need of full conversion, he says, you must get permission for the mind of Christ to function within you. The mind of Christ to function within you. Let this mind, the mind of Christ, let it be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let it be, let that mind function within you. Now, now, if you go further down in Philippians chapter 3, verse 15, he begins to help us to understand even all the more how this is to be applied. He says, therefore, let us, there it again. He talks about the participation that we're engaged in. He says, as many as are mature. Now, look at the qualifications, as many as are mature. So the reason that you're hearing this message tonight is to grow you up. The reason that the instructions that have been given uh, from this pulpit is to help you mature in the things of God. And those that are maturing in God can hear the message because we're feeding you with the resources that will feed those that are committed to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. He says, therefore, let us and, and, and it's, uh, he's talking, Philippians, let us as many as are mature have this mind. Let us 
as many are mature. Let this mind be in you that's in Christ Jesus. Let us, as many as are mature, <coughs> have this mind, possess this mind. <coughs> First he says, let this mind or allow this mind to be in you. He's speaking to that as a general statement. Whoever wants this mind, allow this mind to be in you. Receive this. Receive the thoughts of God. Receive the mind of Christ. He said, but now if you mature, you have this mind. Uh, as mature, you have this mind. And he says, and if, if in anything you think otherwise. Now listen to what he's saying here. You have, let this mind, you have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. He says, but nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, lest we be, let us be of the same mind. Now let's look at that in a message, paraphrase, because uh, Eugene Peterson really breaks this down. He says, so let us keep focused on that goal. Now, what is the goal? Let this mind be in you that's in Christ Jesus. Now that we have allowed this mind to be in us, let us maintain our focus on that goal. Let us not lose focus on the fact that we are gaining knowledge, that we are growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. So let us maintain our focus. Let us remain our focus. Stay focused on that goal. It is saying that I've not attained as of yet, but I've set this as my goal. He said, those of us who want everything God has for us, that's the objective. We don't want to stop halfway. We want everything that God has for us. And then he says, now if any of you have something else in mind, now it is, it, it, it is really saying or expressing the fact that some other thought may enter in or some other idea may try to enter in and, and, and try to uh, align itself or to connect itself with, with those thoughts that ought to be exclusively directed towards him, where we, as we love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Now, if anything else comes to mind, any else in mind, something less than total commitment, I mentioned that is radical, anything less than total commitment, this is what he says, God will clear your blurred vision. God will begin to show you those areas of distraction. He will bring it to your mind so that he can get you back on focus. He says, and, and, and you'll see it yet. Isn't that good to know that even when we get off base, when we begin to drift in the wrong direction, that God has a way of showing us that we've drifted, that we don't try to justify uh, the behavior that's, uh, that's not pleasing to God. But God will show us yet. He will yet show us. Now that we are on the right track, this is what we said earlier, stay focused. Let's stay on it. Don't jump track. Stay on the right track. Stay on the right course. And that's what the enemy is trying to get many of you to do, is to change courses and to get off track. So God is saying, now that you're on track, stay on track. Uh, the, the track, the teaching, sound doctrine, the instructions given, the things that God is saying. So none of these things are just saying, they're not just throwing things at you, but God has given us a course. Uh, that's why we are going so many uh, messages in the same direction, because this is a course that God wants us to take in life so that we are progressing in our knowledge of him. Now, now, look at the rest of this. When we begin to, our commitment is to live life on purpose. We are not just living purposeful lives. We, we are living purposeful lives. We must have a purposeful existence. And in that, we are principle-driven. And, and, and we're purpose-driven. So, so the motivation we mentioned is love, but now because we love, we 
maintain principles. We live by principles, and now we are living uh, our lives. We're driven by the purpose for this cause. We want to accomplish this particular end. Now, now the thing that we have to check out, this is what Paul was speaking of in Philippians 3.15 when he talks about wrong motives and the like, because wrong motives, oftentimes, it, it, you're motivated by some other means. Some other thing will enter in, and, and then that becomes a motivation rather than the thing that ought to motivate you. You, you see, that's what the enemy would love to, to happen within your life so that something else enters in. And now you, you'll say, I'm no longer motivated. I'm no longer on fire uh, for, for God. My passion is not after God. Or it could be something even that, that could be a good thing. But if it's not God himself, I don't care how many things you may be thinking would be pleasing to him, he wants to be the motivation for your life. Now, we talked about those that are uh, moving in that track, let's say, towards God, those that have a semblance of who God is. But then we also look at the world. Let's look at the world. Look at those who are in the world. Let's look at those who have not heard and, 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 and uh, the things that are happening around us. We look at rapes, murders, and robberies, and crime in the streets, and activities where uh, all kind of things are happening all around us. And we wonder what is going on in the world. Why are people behaving the way they're behaving? And, and much of what is going on is unprovoked, is unprovoked actions. It, it doesn't take anything to trigger a, 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 a reaction, not, not a response that's where thought is given because it says, let this mind be in you. That's in Christ Jesus. But we're talking about Actions, people that are re reactionaries. Something happens and they react to the thing that might have occurred, regardless of how small or minuscule it may be. But yet we can see unprovoked murders, un unprovoked uh, 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 crime that's being uh, committed on a day to day basis. And in that, we begin to see that's the loss of self control. Or I won't just say the loss of self-control. It's when people are out of control and, and, and they engage in uh, unreasonable behavior. Unreasonable behavior. They are unpredictable. Anything might happen. Anything might occur. Sometimes it's almost like a powder keg that's about to be ignited at any moment. Why? Because at that particular point, you see, there's no pursuit to know the mind of Christ, but what happens, they lean to their own understanding. They are people that are motivated by the external things that are happening all around them, or they perceive is happening at any given time. So now, in that, wrong motives can cause people to... Uh, be motivated by some other means. They are motivated by some other means. Now, 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 as you begin to look at this, we begin to look at, we talk about motives. Uh, that's a question. Uh, the why question is usually the first question. Why are you doing the thing that you're doing? Why are you acting the way you're acting? But oftentimes, it's not always a question of what are you doing, but why are you doing it? You see, it is not just what you're doing, because when you begin to look at it, this is what's happening. This is what's going on around us. But the question is, why is it happening this particular way? What's going on behind the scenes that's causing people to act the way they act, to think the way they think, and to do the things that they're doing? So now when we begin to look at the why question, not just look at what they're doing, and that's where the attention is usually focused upon what is happening, what is going on, but then God is able, see, God wants us to look behind the scenes and begin to ask the question, why? Because people are in need of a cause. They are in need of a cause. You see, you remember people talk about a rebel without a cause is a person that is driven without purpose. So now, they're involved in 
unprovoked actions. Unprovoked actions. They, uh, the loss of self-control, out of control. And as a result of it, you begin to look at their behavior. Their behavior does not require reasoning. Jesus, God said, let us reason together. But now we begin to see unreasonable behavior. Unreasonable behavior. People that doesn't make sense in the things that they're doing. Senseless acts of violence taking place as a result of not reasoning or thinking things through or not thinking deep enough into matters. So in that, and, and then that's just one side. We begin to observe that, but now let's look inside of the hearts of individuals, some who might not have gone to that extent, but yet they're in an emotional frenzy. Their emotions out of control. Uh, we begin to see those that are giving expression to the, to, to the uh, disturbances taking place within them. You, you see the anxieties that uh, are within their souls, and they do all kinds of things that we would frown upon, or we will ask the question, why are they doing this thing? But now, let's look at the person who might not be acting out uh, the violence from within, but yet he or she is in emo emotional frenzy. They, they do not have peace. The peace of God is missing or lacking within their lives, you see. And that's something that we have to look at, and we see that all around us. And you, you begin to say, well, the only thing that may be holding them back is some level of, of, of sanity or, 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 or some uh, ethic or morals that, that they would still hold on to to keep them from acting upon what is really taking place within their souls. So now, as we look at this, Jesus had a, a cause. Jesus had a cause. He had a reason for doing what he was doing. He had a reason for coming to the earth in human form. In fact, the Bible says in, in John chapter 18, verse 37, he says, Jesus answered, you said rightly that I'm a king. He was asked, are you a king? He said, you said rightly I'm a king. He said, for this cause, listen to the word, for this cause I was born. And then he didn't stop there. He says, and for this cause I have come into this world. He said, this is the cause. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into this world. When he says I've come into the world, he, said, he is indicating the fact that he is not from this world, but he came into this world. Why? For this cause. He says, now the reason that I, he recognized that he came from heaven, he recognized that he was sent forth to do the will of the Father. He says, I have come that I may bear witness to the truth. I have come, the very purpose for my existence is to bear witness to the truth. And then he goes on to say, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Those who are of the truth. We mentioned the mature ones are the ones that are eager to receive a message that will mature them or lead them to greater levels of maturity. But the, those who are not interested in maturing will look for another voice or move in a different direction. But then the Lord Jesus Christ himself says, he said, those who are of the truth will hear my voice. In other words, they will receive the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, all through Scripture, all through Scripture, we begin to see. Uh, a, 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 I wouldn't write all the Scriptures down, but I just wanted to allude to the fact that we begin to see where reasoning took place, and they reasoned among themselves. They reasoned. You begin to look at Scripture, and you'll see many instances where they said they reasoned among themselves. Now, Jesus Christ was introducing something to them when he answer said that I'm a king for this cause I was born and, and I've come into the world to bear witness 
of the, to the truth, and everyone that is of the truth will hear my voice. But then many reason among themselves. That's what the scripture says. They reason among themselves. It is really saying they, the limits to their rationale is usually their environment. In other words, the people around them, their reasoning, they're bouncing information off one another, and they arrive at a conclusion based upon what people are saying around them, you see. But, but, but understand, and then you'll look at Scripture again, and you'll see others would consult with those who are, are, are like them, or, and then others will consult with mediums and wizards and, and with spirits, you see, with all of these uh, uh, spirits. And in their reasoning, they're, they're looking f into another world, into the world of mysticism, and, and understand, they connect with demons and alien spirits in order to receive information from the dark side. And as a result of it, they begin to reason, and their reasoning is motivated as a result of what they've picked up from demons. Now, now, now remember the story of Job. Job, when Job began to, who was the most righteous man in his time, and you know, all the challenges and persecutions he went, the, the, he went through, how the devil really took him through the ringer. But uh, then he began to question God as to why these things were happening the way they were happening. And the Lord had to bring some correction to Job. Here in the 38th chapter of Job, and I'm just reading a portion of it, but it was a whole lot in this, where God began to correct Job and put Job in his right place. But this is what he said. We talk about reasoning. He, he said, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now, that's something. That's a mouthful. Who is this? He's speaking. In other words, he's speaking. Who, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Who is this? who darkens counsel, darkens counsel. In other words, you put a blanket on spiritual reasoning by words without knowledge. In other words, you don't know what you're talking about. He said, he says, you're speaking based upon what you're observing and you're allowing yourself to, uh, to, 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 to think in a way that you ought not be thinking. Then he says, now prepare yourself like a man, and you want a reason, I'm going to question you, and you shall answer me. He said, now, he is saying, on a different level, now let's reason based upon my questioning you. Rather than you questioning me, I'm going to ask you some questions. Where were you? when I did such and such? Where were you when this was made and that was made? Where were you, Job? And, and, and Job had to recognize the fact that he was darkening the counsel by words without knowledge, as many do today. It's when their rationale is opposite of what God knows. And then they want to match wits with God based upon the little that they might have attained a little information they attained from their studies. Now, now I, I want you to look at some things for the sake of time. Let's move on here. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse uh, uh, 28, he says, now we look at counsel, counsel, for, there, for they are a nation void of counsel, nor, there any, uh, all, nor is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Now, in this, he is helping us to understand that nations, now we look at a nation, uh, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, but now nations who do not understand, there's any understanding in them, they don't understand who God is, making decisions void of counsel, making decisions outside of the will of God. Do you see that? A nation. What's happening with our nation, what's happening with nations all over the world is when decisions are made and God, they've not reasoned or, the, or spiritual reasoning is left out of the equation. 
Oh, there's so much I can say about that. That's the message in of itself, is that I don't care which, uh, how our culture might have evolved to a point, but now we begin to see where godlessness has, has, has uh, replaced godliness. So now he says, look at a nation, void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end, because it's leading to something. It's leading to something. The, the information, the decisions that are being made in the world where God is left out of the equation is leading to something, and is leading to destruction because they've not considered their latter end. Every road leads to a destination, but only the road that God has paved for us leads to life. So now reasoning together, listen to what I'm saying. When I talk about reasoning together, look at this from a positive. Reason together, uh, when we reason with the Lord, with the origin and master of thought, with absolute goodness as his objective. We're talking about God. When we reason together with God, then he's a master. He's the origin of goodness. He's the master of thought. He's a thought of thoughts, you see. The original thinking came from him. But in his thinking, it's with absolute goodness as his objective. I was thinking about a musician who would play uh, a, a, a duet with a, ma maestro, with a maestro. <clears throat> and, and I've seen that happen where the maestro would invite one to the stage and the maestro would, or, or the, would do the singing along with that person and cause them to look good because they were singing with the master. <clears throat> Michael Jordan made his team look good when he would play basketball he would feed the other players, and the player could make a layup. He could do all kinds of things because he was, a, he was a star in his own ranks, but he made stars by having supporting stars. You see, his, his, those who worked with him also became stars because they were playing with a star. You, you see, we begin to look at, I was thinking about the uh, trumpeter, Miles Davis. I talked about that many years ago where Miles Davis would play his trumpet and, 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 and another person would be playing on the instrument and they hit a wrong note, they hit a sour note. But to Miles, it wasn't a sour note. He would take that sour note and begin to work his way around that sour note in order to start a whole new song. So, so what happens, you would not see the mistake because the master has a way of covering the mistakes of those who are in a supportive role. So he covers, so, so now we look at, I'm, I'm going to show you how the Lord does that, how he covers our defects and compensates for our deficiencies. You see, God can cause us to make sense, can make sense out of what would be senseless babble, but as a result of God working with us, the things that we say are made to be sensible. Peter and John, in Acts 4, 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John uh, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled that they, and realized that they had been with Jesus. So the presence of the Lord brought them to the place where their lives were impactful even though they had not been trained or well-trained. So now we're talking about spiritual reasoning uh, it, it, it's, uh, spiritual reasoning is unconventional. Spiritual reasoning is unconventional reasoning. When I talk about it being unconventional, you have to understand how God operates. We talk about the mind of Christ here in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25 where Jesus says at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank God, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, but you reveal them unto babes. He says, so now you're going to take what the wise and prudent could not communicate or convey or even understand, but a babe can understand it. 
That's what he's saying. So, so, so look at how God compensates. I want to get back to that. How God compensates for our deficiencies. Here in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, likewise the Spirit helpeth our weaknesses. Because here we are, we talk about the maestro helping the helpless. We don't even know what things to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. You say he steps in like Michael Jordan would, 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 would compensate for a player that could not operate on his level. He said he intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered because he who searches the heart, and he knows the intentions, he knows what the mind of the Spirit is. He brings us along with him, self, so that now we have the mind of Christ because he makes intercession for us, intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So as a result of being a team player, reasoning together with him, then we end up serving and doing those things that please God. And then that's how all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are the predestined. So wisdom is, the Bible says in Proverbs 4, 7, wisdom is the principal thing. He said, therefore, get wisdom, and in all thy getting, get understanding. Now, we have to understand what he's saying here. Get wisdom, get wisdom. Pr wisdom is the principal thing. Now, now, I'll put it this way. I'll put it this way to help you understand it. In other words, don't be a place, we saw Peter and John being untrained and un uh, untrained individuals. It is saying to us today, get an education. But do not allow it to serve as a substitute for spiritual understanding. Learn all you can learn. Get, read books. Uh, go to school. Get degrees, as many degrees as you can get. But don't let those things stand as a substitute for spiritual understanding. Learn all you can, but subject whatever you learn to the knowledge of God. We talk about unconventional wisdom uh, uh, versus conventional wisdom. Look at what uh, Jeremiah says in nine, Jeremiah 9, 23, the Lord, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this. Look at this thing. Now, this is the relationship that we enter into, that he understands and knows me. Now, that's what we talk about, that you are communing with God, that you understand the mind of Christ. You are, you see, it, it is reasoning together that we understand and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, judgments, and righteousness in the earth. He says, for in these things I delight, says the Lord. There are so many scriptures to help us to understand this. Here in 1 Corinthians 1.20, it says, where is the wise? Where are they? Now, let me read that out of the message, too, because I want you to see it from that perspective. So where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? You, you see, in other words, really getting there, really having arrived. He said, hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? So when you think you got it all together, God will expose it as pretentious nonsense. Since the world, in all its fancy wisdom, never had a clue when it came to knowing God. God, in his wisdom, took delight in using what the world considered dumb, that's called preaching, of all things, to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. While Jews clamor for miraculous demonstrations and Greeks go in for, they go in for philosophical wisdom, we go right on proclaiming Christ, the crucified, Jews treat this like an anti-miracle, and Greeks pass it off as absurd. But to us who are personally called by God himself, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's ultimate miracle, 
and wisdom, all wrapped up in one. Human wisdom is so tinny, so impotent, next to the seemingly absurdity of God. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's weakness. Take a good look, friends, at what you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, not many influential and many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God desperately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? Choose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies? Look at God's work now. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Every, everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. Mm. Blow a trumpet for God. If you're going to blow it, blow a trumpet for God. So now, what about those who are ignorant and unlearned? What about those who would otherwise be rejected? This is what we have to understand. Uh, Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Look what he's saying. When the soul is converted, now the mind and the will and the emotions are harnessed, are harnessed as a result of being subjected to the law of God. But then he goes on to say that the testimony of the Lord, when we bear the testimony of the Lord, it is sure, making wise the simple. So regardless of how simple you might have been, now the wisdom of God will override your simplicity. Why? Because you carry within you the experience of Christ. You see, you're not speaking about something you read or something somebody taught you. You're talking about that intimate relationship that you have with Christ, and now you're speaking from that perspective. That's how Peter and John were able to convince others because they had a personal relationship. Last scripture, last scripture, last scripture. Here in Isaiah chapter 28 and 11, we talked about how he reveals it to babes. Uh, he says, now, you won't make sense to the world, but you'll make sense to God. And you may not, may not make sense to people within the ch in Christendom, but you'll make sense to those who are born again and those who are desirous of knowing the Lord. He says here in, 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 in 28th chapter of Isaiah, verse 11, he says, For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. So he doesn't talk the way you like for him to talk. He doesn't say the things you like for him to say. He doesn't make sense to those who would, don't really want to know him because he says to the wise and prudent, those that think they already know. He says, but with stammering lips and another tongue. In other words, God is coming another way, contrary to the way you expect him to come. He said, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. He says, and this is the refreshing. This is refreshing. See, you thought it would be in that direction or the other direction. He said, this is it. This is the real deal here. This is the reflection. Yet they would not hear. Why? Because it didn't come in the way they wanted it to come. It wasn't wrapped in the kind of intellectual package that they were expecting it to be in. He said this, but they would not hear it. They couldn't receive it. But the word of the Lord was still to them. God was still directing his message towards them. How was it? It was precept upon precept. It was precept upon precept. It was line upon line. Uh, it was line upon line, here little and there little. In other words, you had to put it into its proper perspective. 
because it was precept upon precept. If you look at what was being said, you begin to see the precept aligned itself with another precept. Another precept aligned itself with another precept. Line upon line, line upon line. You begin to see there was wisdom a little here and then over the, or a little over there. He said, and the objective was not for them to be intellectually sound or intellectually secure, but that they might go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and caught, arrested. He said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said you have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passed through, it would not come to us. That's what they were saying. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehoods we have hidden ourselves. But God is saying that I will speak with stammering lips and another tongue to cause the weary to rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. My yoke is easy and my burdens are light and you will find rest for your souls. So when the Lord says, come, let us reason together, it is an invitation to enter into the Lord's rest. He said, I'm going to show you where my rest can be found. God invites us to that experience, church, so that you're not struggling, striving to make something happen, but you're taking the yoke of the Lord upon you, learning from him, and progressing in your walk with him because he is bearing the greater load. His yoke is easy and his burdens are light because you're yoked together with him. So, Father, thank you so much for the invitation. And we have a good reason to serve. You have a good reason to be faithful. We have a good reason to engage in the things you've called us to engage in. And may we never in a place where we are leaning to our own understanding and trying to operate independent of you, but recognizing, Lord, that we need you even in those things that we would consider to be small because it's in you we live, we move, and we have our being. So, Lord, I pray that this message will Take root within the hearts of your people. And as a result of it, they will begin to, their reason and their rationale, spiritual reasoning, will be convincing even to those who are lost. They will be able to give a good answer for the confidence they have in you. And they can speak in such a way that their message will be convicting and convincing to sinners. So we give you the honor, we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God for you and we just pray that you'll take hold of what God is saying to us. See, when I'm ministering, it's not just going out, it's also coming back to me again as well. And I trust that we are, we are grabbing hold. God is talking and he's helping us to see to know and understand how good he really is. And as a result of knowing him, we can also make him known. So if you are coming to a place in your life, if you come to a place in your life where you're saying, I want to know this Christ. I want to know him this way. And I want to continue to know this Christ in this way. Then by all means, this is your opportunity to give your heart and your life to him. You see, don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself to believe that all is well because you might have made a decision at one time or another, but you've never really known him. You've never been introduced to him. 
This is what we are trying to do, is introduce you to Jesus Christ as he is. And, uh, you know, you could say you know a person because you've, you, you, you've read the book or you've seen their name printed. You might have taken a picture of somebody standing with a celebrity. Is I know this person, and you can boast and brag of knowing. That's about as much as some people have gone in knowing the Lord because you have taken a picture, or you've tried to identify with him by having bragging rights, the fact that you've been in the church a long time. But we're talking about really knowing the Lord, really knowing him, and allowing his life to become life within you. If you've not done this as of yet, as of yet let it be tonight. Let it be right now that you will surrender your heart, your life to him. I'm going to pray for you, but I want you to pray and invite him into your life. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that there will be those who will confess you as Lord, believe in their hearts that you, Father, raised Jesus from the dead, and the reason Jesus came and died for this cause, that they might be saved, that they might be redeemed, that they may receive the life that's being offered to them tonight. So Lord, let this be the night that they'll confess. And if you're listening to this, ask Jesus to come into your heart, come into your life. Ask, for, ask him to forgive you of sin, the sin of rebellion, the sin that you inherited. You say, well, why should I ask you to forgive me of something that I inherited? Because that's your nature. He can only give you a new nature when you despise the old. So now you have to have the same attitude towards the old that he has towards it. It's worthy of death. So now you're saying, Lord, I'm sorry that I have embraced the life that was mine as a result of Adam. But now I'm changing partners and I'm embracing the life that's offered to me in Christ. That's what repentance is all about. And once you receive that, believing that if he can raise Jesus from the dead, he can change your life and give you new life. And if you're doing this right now, I want to be the first to welcome you into the family of God and understand after you've come into the family of God, you have all the rights and privileges of any other saint, any other believer, regardless of how long they've been saved, you now have this life residing within you. But now you have to learn of him. You say, if newborn babes desire the earnest milk of the word that they may grow, the instructions will make the difference between your growth or, or not growing at all. So let's grow together as we receive the word together. Without a church, by all means, we're here for you to help you in your spiritual growth and development. If you have a church already or know of a church that's teaching the word, that can help you in your growth, by all means, connect with that church. Be a part of that ministry so that you can receive the instructions and grow in grace the knowledge of the Lord. And then, being filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, initiation into the work of God, by all means, uh, that's important that you do that. As Jesus Christ will baptize you in the Spirit. Uh, and also, water baptism is an outward expression of an inward work and to identify with Christ's death through baptism. We can arrange that for you if you desire to be baptized in water. So all of these are invitations to you and we trust that you will take God up on his invitation as he's invited you to come to him and receive that which he's offering you. The information is on the screen as to how you might respond with us and we just look forward to hearing from you. And if this message is meaningful to you and you know others that need to hear it, by all means, share the message with those that you love enough to share life with. Uh, that's what we want you to do, share the message. And also, we would like to know who you are, so let us know that you've been watching and uh, listening and it's making a difference in your life. Uh, co correspond with us. It, it's encouraging to know that there are people that's being blessed as a result of what God has given us to give to them. And last but not least, let us prepare our hearts and minds to honor God through giving in that the tithe, a measure, uh, a tenth is a measure. We go beyond the measure with an offering unto the Lord. 
And the, as we are generous, as the Lord is generous unto us, and as we have received from him, let us respond by giving unto the work of ministry, because when you do that, this is giving to the Lord. So let us prepare our hearts, and Father, speak to the hearts of your people. And thank you so much for your generosity towards us. And it, it makes it easy to respond when the love is so genuine. So we thank you for this opportunity, and we pray that uh, those that have heard, that, that their attitude will be of such, not just giving in the offering, but giving of themselves. Uh, give it to you first and to others so that they, as they're being blessed, they can be a blessing. So we thank you for this opportunity. We give you all the honor, all the praise and glory. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, and we look forward to Sunday morning. There's so much I want to share with you concerning the goodness of the Lord, and we're just going to stay there and just continue to pour our hearts out to you, and we trust that you'll continue to receive from the Lord that offering that God has get granted you through us. So God bless you. May your hearts be blessed. May you be, may you prosper in all things, uh, and may your lives glorify the Lord in, in ways beyond your expectations. So we give you the honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.